Hey folks, what's up? How you feeling? Getting a little burnt out? It's that time of year again. You know, the fall time in Japan is pretty busy with speech contests, finals, um, culture programs, all kinds of stuff. It's the, bu- it's the busiest time I feel. There's a lot packed in, you know. And um, I don't know, before we go on our vacations in about a, a month here, um, I just wanted to figure out a way, like, I, you know, I started thinking, like, how can I get more content out? You know, for me, ideally, it would be having a conversation with people. That's how I like to learn. Um, I like to like to talk. I like to find people who have different viewpoints and experiences as um, compared to what I do and what I've done and learn from them. But if I can't, you know, have a conversation with them, what's the next best thing that could be helpful to you? Um, well, you know, writing a blog post for ALTTrainingOnline.com. Um, that came out on November 19th, Sunday. And... Um, I thought I'll just read you what I wrote for those of you who don't have time to read and would rather listen to it and uh, comment along the way, okay? Now, now I'm big on using um, technology or trying to use technology. There's a lot of technology um, on the internet, on phone apps, on pads that are being, you know, underutilized, you know, here in the Japanese school system. Um, Luckily, I have my own Eikaiwa. That's one of the reasons I started my own Eikaiwa, so that I could implement those, um, you know, technologies as a learning tool, okay? And uh, one service, you know, technology is Netflix. I mean, it's it's great. I mean, great for watching and great for high interest. So here we are um, with my title. Netflix is your high interest and low cost authentic language learning resource by WeTran, yours truly educational technology columnist, okay? So, so I'm here. The dream as reality. As an English teacher, it would be a dream if you could buy a book or a set of flashcards from a publisher, use it for a month with all of your students, and then return all of those resources free of charge if all of your students did not like them one bit. That dream exists today in today's 21st century language learning classroom. Netflix has thousands of high-interest English-speaking content that is easily delivered across computers, tablets, and smartphones. Depending on the title, authentic English entertainment can also be viewed with dubbed Japanese, Chinese, Korean, Spanish, and French voices, as well as a selection of foreign language subtitles. So there's more than enough selection out there for every age group, for every um, second language level for there. Now, it's of course, it's up to the teacher to kind of curate that, try to figure out what is it that the student would like and is appropriate to their level. All right, next part, the content. There are thousands of titles in all genres to fit the tastes and interests of any language learner. The separate kid category even breaks down content from pre-K to pre-teen. Some excellent high-interest content at the kid level, or just kid at heart, are Curious George, The Magic School Bus, Camp Lake Bottom, the now retro Full House, and its descendant, the rebooted Fuller House. All of the aforementioned titles feature Japanese and English audio, and some also have subtitles in both languages. Jim Henson's Word Party takes basic reading and phonetic skills to an interactive level that works well with a touchscreen device or high-speed computer. The cute animal characters ask questions in a variety of languages, and the student must listen carefully to select the correct answer. This Netflix original show is a particularly useful way to monitor students' listening comprehension and pronunciation skills. The language learning activities. Once a high-interest movie or TV series is chosen, the skill building can begin. Streaming content can be used as a pre-knowledge exercise and in parallel with key language lessons and skills or used to model speaking rhythm and natural intonation, and even as a reward for completion of reading, writing, or test-taking skills. Here are just a few effective activities. Read the classic children's book, The Polar Express, and then view the film. Watch episodes of Full House, first in Japanese audio with Japanese subtitles, and then rewatch with English audio and subtitles. Watch scenes of books adapted to film, such as The Hunger Games, The Little Prince, and a series of unfortunate events before reading each chapter. 
have students listen carefully to documentaries such as Cosmos and then have them brainstorm and write questions about each episode, as well as practice interviewing each other with student-generated comprehension questions. Now, I know that's pretty high level, this last one from Cosmos. This is more for like returnees or high level university adult students here. So I'm trying to get a wide range of abilities here and ideas depending on the needs of your students. Another one, have students take dictation to lines of dialogue and then have them check for accuracy by turning on the subtitles after writing. Have students turn on the English subtitles, copy down their favorite scene, and then have them act out the scene. Read this article about a JTE that does this with success. So there is a um, link there to a Japan Times um, article um, where it says a Hachi Oji teacher closes global education award. And another one, have students sing along to the titles to musical films and live concert shows by turning on the English subtitles. All right, the cost breakdown. A one-month free trial and a cancel-anytime policy makes Netflix an extremely cost-effective way to bring real English language tools for less than the cost of a new instructional DVD, workbook, or even of Kaiten Zushi. All levels of monthly membership include basic services of unlimited movies and TV shows, cancel anytime, and first month is free. The basic level of service of 650 yen per month limits your classroom to only one screen for viewing at a time. No access to HD or ultra HD quality content. I mean, 650 yen, that is cheap for all that content. Now you're limited to only one screen, you know, um, so that's up to you. Uh, I recommend is, you know, if you have a big TV or a projector is to have the kids watch in groups. You can make um, a bunch of, you know, separate accounts for names. I think it's up to five. But then they can, you know, join up together and let them decide together and everything. And the great thing is it stops and it pauses and remembers where you left off in any uh, movie or video or series. Okay. All right. Here's the next part. The caveat and its caveat. The price point is definitely not the make it or break it aspect when it comes to using this almost limitless English learning resource. In fact, too much content may have a paralyzing effect on some teachers, since it will be up to the teachers themselves to sift through, check for appropriate age level content, and curate what their students will find most interesting after a viewing or two. Lastly, despite having a large amount of Japanese entertainment such as kid-friendly shows, dramas, anime, and NHK programming, the majority of which is only available in Japanese and without English audio or subtitles. Just like computer literacy, Cinema culture or movie literacy depends strongly on the personal preferences and activities of each student's particular family. Yet, if the teacher knows their student's skills well and their personal interests even better, then it takes just a few simple clicks to find or switch content that the student will happily wish to focus on during every lesson. So, look, you know, if you're just gonna basically plop them down to watch a video and not monitor them and it's a babysitter, that's not gonna work. I mean, it will work to a certain level that it's high interest, they'll get focused on it, they like it, but you as a teacher should be making sure that it's appropriate to them and what they're learning in class, either grammar-wise or phonics-wise um, or just maturity-wise, okay? Um, now, keep in mind is, in the beginning, I kind of let the students, you know, have full reign. They were limited in the kids' department because it's all like family friendly. And I let them try to choose in, in groups just so they would get comfortable of using the interface and navigating. But then after a while, I would start to like purposely give them, you're gonna watch an episode of Fuller House. Um, I'm gonna turn on the subtitles in Japanese. Um, I want you to, you know, try to take dictation. Um, I want you to try to like write, you know, 10 words that you hear any number of other activities. So you have to go back and forth with just pure enjoyment and then also, you know, skill building using that media. Sharing. Did this blog post inspire you or you still need of ideas? Perhaps you have a lot of time to prepare your posts, comments, questions, and lesson plans on the topic on the ALTTO Facebook group. So if you have your own ideas, I highly suggest getting on there and 
starting your own blog, um, writing about this in the Facebook group. And um, please take a look at more blogs at www.altrainingonline.com slash blog.html. Okay, so hmm, this is one of my short, uh, I guess, blog posts that I'm putting up here and just reading about. So if you have any more questions out there about using um, Netflix, you know, go ahead and uh, contact me. But um, really, it's it's great. It's great. It's high interest. The kids love it. Um, and I don't have to pay a lot for materials. And for school owners out there, it's a great um, write-off. Now, here's the thing. If you're going to be using this like in the classroom, um, one thing to remember is <coughs> is um, you will need... <coughs> Um, the thing to remember is like when you're using uh, the computer and everything, you'll need a uh, internet connection because it's going to be live streaming. Unless there are a few um, movies or videos that you can actually download and you can watch it later on your device without an internet connection. Okay. Um, also, uh, I've learned that you cannot um, you cannot uh, project or have the signal go out from your iPad or um, smartphone to the TV uh, from Netflix. Now you can do that with uh, a computer with a laptop, okay, but not from a smart device that's like a tablet or thing like that. So keep that in mind is if you want to use it in class, um, you know, the, the app does not work as um, going out into a TV off of a smartphone or a tablet, but it does work going out from a web browser. Um, so maybe that I'm, I haven't tried that from the web browser off the phone, maybe it works that way, but I know that a web browser, you know, watching Netflix off of a computer, um, either hooked up by HDMI or through a VGA cable, VGA monitor, um, or RGB cable, um, will work. So, you know, keep in mind of that. And always, 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 you know, like, you know, test it out before you're going to use it in the class. Um, and really watch your whole video first so that's appropriate. And know where to, if there's something questionable, know where to pause, know where to skip, you know, that kind of thing. But, um, you know, there's not a, a lot of content out there that you can, that you, can um, you know, view. So anyway, that is my educational technology tip for you. All right. All right, you know, I stopped with my um, my blog, and then I started reading the rest of the other blogs from different people, and I thought, well, why don't I just continue here, you know? So the next one is titled ALT Privacy Perspectives in Japan, and let's see here. Bio, Dr. Nathaniel Simmons taught English in Japan for two and a half years in Japan's Kansai region in Nara from 2007 to 2009. Um, and Osaka, 2013. Simmons is an American communication professor who studies privacy management within intercultural and health context. Okay. Um, his research is published within USA national and regional journals as well as international journals. And he recently authored Gaijin Private Parts, Maintaining Privacy at Work in Japan, which examines how privacy is managed between foreign English teachers and their Japanese co-workers. Simmons co-authored Celebrity Health Narratives and the Public Health, which investigates how celebrity health disclosures and influences, influence public health perceptions, and Bitch Slap APA, which uses satire and humor to teach the American, Psych American Psychological Association's writing style. Please see his website for his CV and further details, http nathanielsimmonsphd.weebly.com. All right. So let's get into it. ALT privacy, privacy Perspectives in Japan. All right. As an ALT, your life will continue to include many things that you may or may not perceive as private information. As a former ALT turned communication professor, I am interested in privacy and how we maintain it but by what we say or don't say. This interest led me to interview nearly 80 participants about how they maintain privacy at work. Half of my participants were ALTs and half were Japanese co-workers, JCWs, such as fellow teachers or supervisors. I share the perspectives and a sum summation of this research below. I think this is a great topic. I mean, we get in the in and out of, um, 
you know, just for me as a teacher, methodology, um, how do we teach a good lesson? But now this is the, the wider social aspect, which can make or break, um, you know, a, a ALT's professional life. You know, especially in a small town, especially in a, in a rural community. I mean, this, this applies everywhere, but especially if you're in rural Japan, okay? So, ALT perspectives. There were no barriers. Every person in the village, every school you know, everyone in the Board of Education. The whole school knew that I broke my leg and what days I was going to the hospital and medication I've been given. given. There's no quiet patient confidenti confidentiality. Jamie. Uh, I get it. I get it. I mean, especially in a small town. Um, luckily, I am Vietnamese American. So, um, you know, I have an Asian face. I can blend in, especially if I wear a mask and I don't talk. So people will probably perceive me more as Japanese and they don't, I don't stand out. If you are uh, non-Asian, it's a lot harder to do, you know, in Japan. So you're always going to be scrutinized for good and for bad. You know, um, but, you know, I've maintained good relationships um, with my teachers um, and students and living in a small town here in rural Japan. At this point, it's like I cannot run into anywhere without running into them or a parent or a former teacher or a school worker or the son or daughter or someone, you know, um, because now my first set of students when I came here about nine years ago, they are now of adult age. They're working in the food service industry, they're working in professional jobs, they are kindergarten teachers. One of them was actually um, assistant kindergarten teacher for my daughters, Yoichien. Um, so, you know, it's just small town living. You know, you don't escape it, all right? Uh, ALTs like Jamie felt their privacy expectations about their A, space and place, B, bodies, C, sexuality, and D, romantic relationships were not upheld by their co-workers. An ALT space or place refers to areas where privacy is expected or an entitled right. For example, Ren said, I feel like a lot of my sense of privacy is violated when I come in to work and stuff is on my desk. ALTs also commented that their home wasn't treated as privately as they wished. Some ALTs were asked for their keys by their employers for repairs or inspections to be made. Stephanie said for her, one of the more surprising things was when I would call in sick to work and somebody would stop by my apartment. Such surprise visits would limit one's chances of taking a mental health day. Informa mental health day is just basically, you know, you're not physically sick. You just need a break, man. You know, because teaching is very stressful, you know, in case. So, you know, you just need a break. So you call in, you call in sick when you're not physically sick. You just mentally need a break. And I think this might have to do more with ALTs that are JETS, I'm assuming here, since they happen to be working for the government and they're usually in the government housing. And so, you know, it's really not not their own that they're renting from they're renting either they're, they're renting um from the uh you know government as a, a government employee so if you're working for a dispatch company it might be a little bit different i mean when i was um you know working for a private company i never had that kind of issue or anything like that so anyway information about an alt's bias were also perceived to be private information by alt's this included health information RT explained after medical visit, it was public knowledge to everyone about what I had gone in for and if I was sick. Like, if I was taking meds and that I was like, this is really weird. Regardless of the ALT's sexuality, ALTs felt that their sexuality or sexual acts should be private and not discussed with co-workers. Tim, a heterosexual man, felt his privacy was invaded when a co-worker asked him about his sexual life. He said, my co-worker... Asked me once how many times I have sex with my wife. I just look at him and go, oh boy, that's way off base. Related one's dating life was also perceived as private and ALTs felt invaded when JCWs questioned them about other foreigners they may have seen with them. They may have seen with them in town or if they were dating someone. LGBTQ ALTs were put in a more precarious space when asked about their dating relationships due to an unawareness and concern for how JCWs would respond to them if they were to come out at come out as LGBTQ. 
Gideon and Gay Man explained, I don't really want to come out at work, so I told them, co-workers, the type of guy I like, but in female version. I changed pronouns. Well, that's pretty smart. When ALTs were questioned about these areas, they felt invaded. All right, next subtitle here, or subheading. How did ALTs manage their privacy? To manage privacy, ALT used A, withdrawal, B, cognitive restructuring, C, independent control, D, lying, E, omission, F, avoidance, and G, gaijin smashing to manage their privacy at work. It's kind of funny. This A through A through F, I, I could even say, you know, um, this is this is not just a, a Japanese, uh, you know, different cultural workplace. These the, the, these these are uh, coping mechanisms or um, strategies that uh, I've used with uh, with workers in uh, my home country of the United States, and uh, probably I would say with certain family members too. So this is not this is not necessarily an ALT only. Um, you know, management system here. Uh, withdrawal refers to retreating from relationships or conversations. In other words, ALTs would make conscious efforts to not get too close to co-workers. Cognitive restructuring refers to instances where ALTs change their perspective, thoughts, or beliefs. ALTs change their perspective by making conscious efforts to alter the way they perceive privacy violations. Independent control refers to taking action into one's own power rather than relying on someone else. For example, if an ALT needed to go to the doctor, they would study up on their medical Japanese and brave the medical encounter by themselves. That's what I do. Lying refers to instances where one purposely did not tell the truth. If an ALT was asked what they were doing for the weekend but didn't want to disclose, they responded by saying, just staying at home. Omission refers to instances where information was left out of conversations or statements. Related to lying, ALTs would leave out details of their daily activities to obtain a sense of privacy. Avoidance refers to instances where ALTs stayed away from situations, conversations, or people that might have otherwise resulted in situations where one's privacy was not easily maintained. Similar to withdrawal, where ALTs would limit how personally close they became with someone to avoid questioning, they would avoid people or situations entirely so as not to be asked questions that might be perceived as private. Gaijin smashing refers to instances where ALTs use their foreign identity as a way to play ignorant of Japanese cultural norms, thus putting them into a place to knowingly violate them to obtain their desired goal. I call that use your Gaijin card. You know, you play that card whenever you feel like, when you can, when it's to your advantage. I mean, I, again, I think I have a different or, um, you know, there's probably a different perception um, out there for um, for uh, uh, Asians that are non-Japanese that are be working in, in uh, Japan because physically, you know, we're, per we're perceived to look the same um, but not exactly act the same. So, you know, depending on how, you know, how... Um, sensitive i want to be towards uh japanese customs and norms and mores uh that i'm comfortable or not comfortable with i play the gaijin card um or not so that's you know that's one that's an advantage we have over regular japanese people you know in general Richard defined Gaijin smashing as it's where you use the fact that you are not Japanese to get out of social interactions of people that are Japanese are usually beholding to. Um, side note, this is kind of funny here, is is not only myself, but uh, Japanese uh, can do this too, especially if they've lived abroad. For example, um, my wife, she lived in the, the U.S. for 10 years and, you know, during her young adulthood of her 20s. And I have another friend who has now crossed over and lived more years in the United States than she has in Japan, but, you know, has lived in uh, Japan, uh, the U.S. for, you know, over 20 years now. And yes, they're both, you know, fully Japanese, but because they can see things through a different perspective, they prefer when they come back is, you know, not to right off the bat, you know, let Japanese uh think that they're japanese if the japanese assume because they talk a little bit funny you know or they don't act perfectly within japanese norms as an adult um again that's to their advantage i remember one time when we were when we were in tokyo um just a few months ago and we're looking at the tokyo subway map and we're trying to figure out like how to, how, how to navigate it and everything 
and a gentleman could hear us talking in English, um, Japanese gentleman, and he came up to help us and started to explain to us in English about how how to you know get to our station. And then I mentioned them. I mentioned them. It's like, oh, you know, by the way, you know, my wife's Japanese. She understands Japanese. And then he was a bit surprised, but then explained to her in Japanese. And my wife was straight up. She was just like, "Don't tell people I'm Japanese." I'm like, well, "Why not? <laughs> you are." You know, it was the first time. She's like, "Because you know what, people, you know, because that he probably thinks I'm just like more confused or I don't understand or whatever." But if people uh, if Japanese people think I'm a foreigner, they actually treat me nicer. And that's been the same kind of response I got from my friend who's been living in the U.S. Is, yeah, she, you know, she prefers to be treated, um, as a, as a foreigner, even though she is Japanese, because, you know, she's not beholden to the same standards. You know, once they find out her name, once they find out she is, then it's, it's a little bit different. So it's kind of funny. Anyway... Hypothetically speaking, Richard described how he responded to moments where he felt his privacy was violated. He said, if someone asks me a question, the answer is on them. You know, like, you asked for it and deal with it is a lot of my mentality. I don't mean it quite so aggressively, but that's how I think about it. I don't want to volunteer information, but if they ask me, I will answer it and they will answer in turn. And it's a little, I don't want to say manipulative, but it creates a situation where I have the upper hand. JCW Perspectives. I just think the concept of privacy is kind of different from Japanese people and English people. Not English people, foreign people. Sasaki. Yes, I totally agree there. Like Sasaki, Japanese co-workers, JCWs, believed privacy was different for Japanese and foreigners. JCWs mentioned the following topics were considered private information. Romantic, platonic, and family relationships. Health, including age and weight hobbies, and personal data such as finances, income, phone numbers, email addresses, as well as where one lives. JCWs are also com commented that privacy is different for foreigners than that it is perceived to encompass a larger scope of items that are considered private than the Japanese. Although that list there that we just got, I think, applies to most foreigners too, you know, depending on the person. At the same time, JCW's mentioned that it is sometimes important to share ALT's private information with others because it helps them help ALT's. For example, if an ALT is sick and works at multiple schools, they need to let other schools know so that that way they may prepare for a possible absence. Ono said, in Japan it's normal, I guess. Maybe if someone gets sick, you know, we co-workers talk about that, right? But for foreigners, maybe it's strange, I guess. Such actions weren't made out of spite, but rather to help the ALT's and the other schools. Hanaguchi explained that it was her responsibility to contact other schools the ALT worked at so that they might be prepared for a potential absence in the future, even if it was a few days off. She described the situation. One ALT has to be absent because maybe he was sick in the morning. But Japanese, we have to call the principal and tell him that the ALT will be absent because of so-and-so. And also, he will visit another school the next day. So maybe we should share those information with them because of the ALT's is sick but also because the maybe the cause is if an alt can speak japanese and contact them directly but maybe we don't do we don't do that but maybe there's a miscommunication the next day the school will wait for him but he does not come before one day day by day they should know so as my job i had to inform them but maybe this is too much for alts laughter how do jcws manage the privacy Japanese co-workers report using the following two strategies to maintain their privacy boundaries. A. Drawing clear boundaries by not talking or changing context. And B. Being proactive by demarcating privacy boundaries early on within a relationship. JCW said that they drew clear boundaries between their work and private life. Tosu said, at work is work. Private is private. I draw a line. It's a different situation. Matsuo echoed Tosu's feelings. She said, I'm very secretive, so I wouldn't talk, especially with my co-workers. Like my private and my work life is a totally different thing. I try to draw a line between these two. So how do they do that? When I asked Kai how she keeps her privacy at work, she said, I try not to talk too much. Silent is good. Koga also believed the best management strategy is to not talk. Koga explained, basically, if I want to keep something secret, I just talk nothing about it. I don't want to tell a lie, so I don't make up stories, but I just try to be honest or talk nothing about this, you know. 
In fact, Japanese co-workers commented, recommended ALTs not share too. If they want their privacy, Sasaki said, if they don't want the people to know, they shouldn't say. They shouldn't. JCW has also stated that it is important to change physical context to maintain privacy. For example, Koga said that when co-workers started to share something private with her, she told them, Okay, I want to listen to you. I want to hear you out, but we can't do that at work, so let's change place. I don't want to discuss my private life at work. She clarified that. A little bit may be okay. A starter, so like, for example, I want to talk about my boyfriend. I'm struggling with them. Oh, okay, I have time tomorrow. Let's go to grab something and hear you out. Overall, Japanese co-workers mentioned the importance of being proactive throughout our discussions. Being proactive referred to taking initiative early on within the ALT Japanese co-worker relationship, relationship to discuss what is considered private in order to avoid potential privacy violations. Maeda explained, private is different. I feel ALT and Japanese teachers thinking about private. So if you know he says, I have two children, or something like that, you think, oh, you have two children. And I don't think this is very secret. So if he or she don't want anyone to know they have children, I want them to tell me, please, don't tell anybody, or this is a secret. That kind of thing. I want them to mention about that. If he doesn't say that, I don't know that I have to keep that private. What's the big picture? ALTs and JCWs both perceive some topics as private. At the same time, JCWs and ALTs perceive each other differently. In my research, ALTs saw themselves as a free space where Japanese cultural norms did not apply and that JCWs could ask them anything. However, as an ALT, it is important to understand Japanese cultural perspectives. One's perceptions of reality are often a bit more complex than we might initially think. JCWs revealed that they that when they shared information about ALTs with others, it is because they care. So it's an important thing is, you know, there is intention behind uh, Japanese co-workers' actions that perhaps don't have share the same value system of you, don't make sense to you, um, you know, but they're not doing it out of malice, you know, um, or any negative bad intention. Nine times out of ten, I mean, humans are humans. I'm sure that there there are out there, um, but yeah, a lot of it is just uh, as you know, the foreign worker. Uh, it's in our own heads. Um, but anyway, for example, sharing an AT an ALT's illness with others allows them an opportunity to find the best resources to make their lives easier. At the same time, there are logistical logistical considerations. If an ALT is sick one day and they work at multiple schools, the workplace that you miss might call your other workplaces to give them a heads up that you're ill and may not make it to work. This helps schools plan and have a worst case scenario in mind in the event that an ALT's class needs to be canceled or postponed. JCW has revealed that it takes time to know someone. The typical ALT contract doesn't help with this. JCWs need time to build trust and friendships. Once trust and friendships are constructed, only then it is it deemed culturally appropriate to share private disclosures for JCWs. At the same time, ALTs are often placed in relationships with their Japanese supervisors, supervisors where they must trust them initially. This is a difficult situation for both ALTs and JCWs, which can lead to frustrations for all parties. However, understanding this cultural difference can be helpful in conceptualizing the intercultural dynamics at play. There are also steps that ALTs can take to protect their privacy. What should I do to maintain my privacy in Japan? Tips time here. One, be proactive. Take the JCW's advice that I spoke with and be proactive. If you share something at work that is private or that you want kept between you and whomever you told, tell them that. Otherwise, you may not know your expectations. They may not know your expectations. Expectation, expectation. Also, don't be afraid to say, I'd love to speak with you about this, but can we go somewhere else? Choose a place that will be comfortable for you both. Two, use privacy management stra strategies from this blog. Try different strategies and see what works best for you. Communication is both an art and a science. There's no wrong or right way. If you try one strategy, strategy and it goes well, then try it again. If it doesn't go well, reconsider trying that strategy. The ALTs I spoke with offered some great tactics that did work for them. In essence, withdrawal, cognitive restructuring, independent control, lying, omission, avoidance, and gaijin smashing. As you decide which to use, ask yourself the following two questions. One, will blank be appropriate for this situation? Or two, will blank be effective for this situation? For example, gaijin smashing, according to the ALTs I spoke with, always works. But is it the most appropriate? What are the consequences of guidance smashing? 
What are your own personal ethics towards lying? Sure, lying and gaijin smashing may work, but ask yourself what unintended consequences might arise as a result of such a choice. Three, use your social networks. Ask fellow ALTs, gaijin, and or Japanese friends questions. If you want to share something with someone else in person, then test the waters and see how a smaller disclosure may land before you share the entire topic for revelation. Don't be afraid to blog it out, sometimes even anonymously. Several gaijin I spoke with did this. Just remember to do it to do so anonymously. Use pseudonyms and not actual names. Be descriptive, but not too descriptive as to give away your location. You wouldn't want your employer to figure out it is you. And yes, some ALT organizations do monitor their employees' social media. So much for privacy, huh, folks? So be careful. Be smart about that. About that. Um, this blog post is based off the book, Gaijin Private Parts, Maintaining Privacy at Work in Japan by Dr. Nathaniel Simmons, available on Amazon in paperback. Excellent. All right, and one more. This is a fairly short one here because I happen to print out three after reading mine. This is from Wednesday, September 20th, 2017. Um, this is from a Caleb Moon, and he's been working in Japan as a junior high school English teacher since 2007, a graduate of Amherst College. His current duties include planning and implementing teacher training curricula, and Moon hides his Japanese abilities from his students, and he's particularly interested in English-only classroom control and grammar presentations. In addition to teaching, Moon sings and plays classical guitar for the ambient folk act Lions and Moon. That's L-Y-O-N-S. And he works as a professional transla translator specializing in the medical field. All right, this is entitled Teaching Solo in Japanese Public Schools by Caleb Moon. Number one, why do you solo teach? Solo teaching by English-speaking natives at junior high schools in Fukuoka City began a few years ago, 2009, if my memory serves me correctly. In response to the BOE's need to adhere more closely to the legal limitations of its contract with Interact, Gyoma Itaku contracts, unlike Haken contracts, forbid the client to give instructions directly to the co-worker. An ALT is, by definition, someone working in a position which is required to take instruction from, indeed, to assist a JTE. The position's name was therefore changed to NS, or Native Speaker, an exceptionally disrespectful title in my opinion, since it includes zero acknowledgement of actual occupation, but hey, I didn't invent it. I also have other um, concerns myself of what is a Native Speaker, and um, I'll get into a whole other uh, podcast about that, but you know, I don't... What does that mean to be a native speaker? That's that's the big that's the big question that I'm asking a lot of people these days in the 21st century. Um, but anyway, number two, what question? What is your opinion of solo teaching? Solo teaching? How is it better or worse than team teaching with a JTE? When that transition to solo teaching was first mandated, I was dead set against it. I had had the experience of working side by side with a number of skilled JTEs and the back and forth we enjoyed, punctuating each other's points and explanations with examples of our own, making fun of each other, much to the students' delight, and utilizing each other to demonstrate real communication to the students, all had me convinced that this was the ideal way to teach English. I remain convinced that it can be ext an extremely effective method for foreign language instruction. But after making the transition to solo teaching, I nonetheless noticed that my average lesson quality had gone up. There are a few likely reasons for this. A. Good team teaching relies on three major vari variables, in addition to many minor variables I acknowledge. A skilled ALT, a skilled JTE, and a strong relationship between the two. I totally agree. I have, um, you know, in my history, I've had probably three or four really really tight skilled JTs I've, I've worked with and we've had an, had an excellent relationship, excellent rapport and doing a team teaching in our class, it was very easy to go back and forth. It was easy for each of us to quote unquote interrupt each other so that the students could hear a very natural back and forth Q and A banter of two very curious um, fluent teachers uh, trying to make, you know, an understanding of the English language. And I think they really benefited from that. And they really enjoyed the class, I noticed. Those those classes where I had that type of um, high-quality relationship and highly skilled teacher, 
um, knowledgeable teacher, uh, you know, none of the students were sleeping. None of the students had um, behavior management issues. You know, they were all very diligent because I think they just really enjoyed the show that we could put on by just being ourselves, you know. So if all three conditions are met, lessons are fantastic, but it only takes one of the three to fail for the entire lesson to become much weaker and the learner's educational quality to suffer. Good solo teaching requires only one major variable, a skilled ALT. Therefore, a skilled ALT who exclusively teaches solo will naturally find a much higher proportion of their lessons to be successful. I agree there. B. Solo teaching affords a pure look at the strengths and weaknesses of the ALT who is completely responsible for the it's capital Q and capital uh, respond for the question answer of the lesson or quality assessment of the lesson. Either one sounds good. If there's a problem with the plan or the execution, the ALT can act alone to make adjustments. So, iteratively, based <laughs> iteration, iteratively based improvements happen much more quickly. This reason highlights solo teaching as an effective activity for promoting professional growth, a well-known and studied aspect of teacher development, thereby allowing the ALT to become a stronger teacher even in team teaching context. C. Solo teaching by ALTs who avoid using Japanese in the classroom, and almost all good ALTs do avoid it, pushes students to comprehend English-only lessons. It also pushes students to cooperate and collaborate more to understand what is going on, developing communication strategies that they need, e.g. breakdown, repair, cooperation, listening skills. Finally, using English as the primary, primary communicative tool raises students' confidence to a degree that is all, almost impossible to realize while using Japanese as a crutch. Totally agree there. I also noticed that my relationships with each of my fellow JTEs had perhaps counterintuitively improved. Perhaps this was because watching someone teach a solo lesson successfully encouraged you to respect them more. But I was, but I think there was a little more behind it. This JTEs rarely have an opportunity to watch English-only grammar presentations. See Module Eight and two papers from Hino, 1988, and Gorsuch, 1998. 1998 on Yakudoku, and this is an ability that we'll need to acquire eventually if MEXT has its way. Therefore, I found that stronger JTEs in particular were deliberately asking me to teach grammar which students had not previously seen, in essence, not a review lesson, both to push the students in new ways and to see for themselves how such a grammar point might be effectively conveyed without the use of Japanese. So I think, you know, if you're in with a, with a very curious, smart, um teacher who's not just doing the yakudoku translation from the teacher's book yeah they're gonna you know watching a great teacher watching a great lesson um is the best way for another teacher to learn um uh, i always found it helpful for me um when i first started teaching in japan was i was looking at a school there was two alts there so if i wasn't um in a classroom myself and it was a prep time and the other alt was um or even English class was being taught, I would go visit them and I would watch, you know, and see how they would, you know, teach a lesson, what activities they would use and, you know, get a little bit of a nugget of their experience, you know, to apply and everything. So I think, you know what, like the best teachers are always the best students too, meaning they're always curious, they're always looking to improve and, learning more and the best way to learn more is but is to just to watch another classroom watch another teacher and everything and and when you see great teaching it's 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 beautiful i mean it's 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 high art it's living art it's you know it's it's entertainment you know and learning it's 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 beautiful anyway solo teaching and team teaching are both extremely effective when done well i am a fan of both in practice however i have found the solo teaching to be more consistently effective than team teaching all right, that is it. Thank you for Caleb Moon. Um, I've not listened to his music, but I'm going to go on YouTube and look for it. And let's see, he's got some references here. Hino and Yakudoku, Japan's dominant tradition in foreign language. Learning Jolt Journal, 1988, uh, volume 10, page 44 to 55. And Gorsuch, and 1998, Yakudoku EFL instruction in two Japanese high school classrooms. An exploratory, exploratory study, Jolt Journal. And ret retrieved from uh, job, pu job publications. Anyway, you can find all this on the blog. 
All right, folks, I hope that's a big help for you. That is three blog posts on three different topics of uh, from the ALTTrainingOnline.com. And that's it. I knocked another one out. We'll see how it goes. I kind of I kind of like this reading out loud kind of thing. So since I do it all the time anyway, but anyway, have a good one. Bye.